Lazo, <laughs> Who
Takashi Dele and uh, greetings to everyone and thank you very much for joining the 13th festival of Tibet which has been going online this year again uh, for the second time and um, tonight we have a very beautiful film uh, written and directed by my friend Mark Gold. Eight Australian um, went on a journey uh, to Mount Kailash and then to the occupied land of uh, Tibet. Um, so this journey, this film is about their journey and what they see and what they have felt during that time. And Mark Gold has captured very beautifully and it was um, premiered on the uh, ABC television in Australia. I'm pretty sure it Many of you have missed it, so I hope you will enjoy this evening's um, film. I hope you will enjoy the film too. Yeah, so thank you for joining us again. Thank you. Bye. A pilgrimage is a journey to honor something. My daily pilgrimage is a walk on Bondi Beach. After many years making films about the Tibetan refugee community, I've made a promise to honour their 60 years of freedom struggle in exile. I intend to lead a group of Australians on a pilgrimage to the spiritual heart of Tibet, the fabled Mount Kailash. No ill health or the fear is going to stop me. I just don't think I can do it. And I saw him in front of me and I thought, To put my promise into action, I contact my old friend, Ongmu. And about a couple of months ago, I get a phone call. I can guess from who? Mark Gould, asking me, would you like to go to Mount Kailash? And I'm going, of course, yes, yes. I recruit the woman and met Adrian on my daily walk. My daughter said, well, you are going, aren't you? And, and I went, well, just don't go with a whole lot of strangers, do you? And she says, well, why not? I walk every day. It's just part of what's in my heart to do. And it will make me reach into the depths of my strength and courage and endurance. And I pull together the men. <laughs> I travel alone. So to go with a group is a whole different set of dynamics that I am not prepared for. You called me up and you said, Freeman, I'm going to Kailash and your attendance is compulsory. I sat with that and I just thought, oh, the bastard. Living near sea level, we all need fitness training. We're going to be five kilometres up in the air. And some of us find expert help. Back, down. And if you've ever walked up very steep mountains and if you've ever walked up very high altitude mountains, knowing how to breathe is a great benefit to you. And then little breath out. Where am I going? What am I going to be doing with this walking? I know nothing. <laughs> I've got a lot to find out, haven't I? We meet together for the first time in Kathmandu. Pouring over the maps, the challenges of our adventure become very real. No Facebook, no Gmail, no Google. We are going from a, a free democratic country to an occupied country. The adventure starts when the plan falls apart. We plan to acclimatise by walking from 3,000 to 5,000 metres through northwestern Nepal. Once in Tibet, we'll trek the circuit, or Kora, 52 kilometres around sacred Mount Kailash. And I can't wait to take the journey. And I start to worry that some of our group may not have found the time to train. A devout Buddhist, Ongmu insists we seek the blessing of a renowned Tibetan Lama to remove any obstacles from our journey. <gasps> we have different reasons for committing to this trek, yet like millions around the world, we have each been touched by the smile of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. 
Despite a lifetime of extraordinary suffering, he is a great inspiration. To find the source of this wisdom, we want to walk Tibet's ancient landscape and try to feel its resilient spirit. And it's just so encouraging to the heart. How supported are we? Our first big leap into the Himalayas begins in a tiny plane. Uh, Nepal has the most <laughs> dangerous airstrips in the world. Are you ready? Uh, I hope so. I'm a bit yeah, nervous. <laughs> We're flying between the mountain peaks, not over the top of them. I can see what looks like a piece of tarmac glued to the side of a mountain, and we were coming straight at it. <laughs> Simicot, our gateway to Tibet, is a hive of activity. Every few minutes, Hindu pilgrims heading for Kailash take the quick option of a chopper to the Tibetan border. But to acclimatise our bodies, we choose the slow lens of a six-day walk. Our local support team meet us just outside town. Their sure-footed mules will carry our food and shelter. To come on something like this at this point in your life is such a fantastic privilege because, you know, it helps fighting time. Our first day trekking throws up some tricky obstacles. So I'm feeling dizzy, quite lightheaded and drunk. Downhill, every footfall is a jigsaw puzzle. I didn't anticipate that the pathway would be as rocky. And I thought, well, I'm in for a bit of a test here. Carmel, I realised very quickly, needed help. It was very nice just to be alongside her and giving her some support and comfort. I'm slow as a snail, but I don't care. It's just beautiful. We could put her in a barrel and just let lower her down. Even Murray loses his footing. What a terrible thing to happen. What's well, my one and only you see on the trip? I hope so. It's our cans down there. <laughs> Day one, definitely harder than we expected. A night's rest in a magnificent Nepalese valley restores our aching bodies. Day two propels us up against the Kanali River. Nature isn't the only force changing the landscape. Our support crew are just the most amazing. They are so strong and they're so little. I can't believe that they do such things. <laughs> Every step helps our bodies acclimatise to thinner air. So this is really hard, harder than I thought. I'm trying to stay Buddhist. <laughs> I'm trying to remember it to say mantras. Really? Yeah. Is that helping? Well, what do you want to be the last <laughs> thought in your head when you fall off the edge? <laughs> She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. You told me we'd be doing a walk in Nepal and Tibet. We would be walking, you said, the Kora around that Kailash. This is mountain climbing. <laughs> don't look down, he says. Just don't, don't look at the backside, he says. <laughs> it was more than inspiring. It was awesome. I'm in heaven right now. To be here, under hot water, looking at the snow capped Himalayas, where we made it. <laughs> 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 
While we wash away the day, Carmel rests her knee. <laughs> I slipped on some rocks. And as, as I slipped, I thought, holy dooling. Oh, it's torn. When the next morning Carmel's knee is more inflamed, somehow Ongmu finds a jeep. And this is the only car available, I believe. We were very fortunate that we found this car. <laughs> the closer we travel to the Tibetan border, the closer we get to Tibet's tragic past. For most people in Western countries, the 1950s Chinese invasion of Tibet is a flickering memory in the fog of the 20th century. But for Tibetans, it was a cultural genocide that almost obliterated their ancient civilization. Many believe that between one and two million people were killed. After China invaded Tibet, many great masters took refuge in Nepal and India. Today, we are walking to Yalbang, home to a thriving Tibetan monastery and a school. peaceful sight just to see the beautiful stupa in the middle of nowhere. The kind of calmness it provided and I felt like I was at home. We were able to light 1,000 butter lamps. We were able to perform prayers so that our journey was going to be smooth. And then we got to meet the Rinpoche. Turns out that he goes to my hometown a lot and he'd also been to Australia, so there was a strong connection. Our immersion here reminds us that Tibet is only a couple of valleys away. We wonder what it'll be like. Um, I'm ready to tackle it. We had a break yesterday and today I really want to get into it and acclimatise and condition myself for Kailash. I feel like I'm just following a goat track. All I'm trying to focus on is my tummy going in and out and my breath going in and out. That was scary. Every step up the valley brings us closer to the source of the river and closer to our reasons for being here. What I found amazing about pilgrimage is what food I'm eating doesn't matter, how I'm looking doesn't matter. What matters to me is I'm living in the moment of gratitude. And Carmel's knee is still a concern. Poor Carmel. I thought she was really healthy. Poor thing, she's having to miss most of the part and really struggling. Part of me was saying, did I do the right thing by inviting her? The next morning, there's a happy solution. Have you ever travelled in a truck oh, before, yeah. on her? Um, everything has been first year in this trip. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to get up into that truck? <laughs> And I'm watching the um, temperature gauge on that truck the whole time. <laughs> I don't think the motor was in very healthy condition. Our last night before the border brings a powdering of snow. I'm here in a circumstance where I feel humans don't belong. Thank you, guys. Yes. I feel I'm an intruder. and the morning challenge of the 800-metre climb up the Narala Pass. The Nepalese ladies can do it. Why can't I? The oxygen at this level <clears throat> means every step is twice as difficult as it would be at sea level. Look, here we are, roof of the world. 
Four and a half thousand meters, or four thousand six hundred? Four thousand seven hundred. Four thousand seven hundred meters. Yes. This horse is so kind. <laughs> so, any regrets? None. None at all. None. Best thing in the world to do. Well, we can tell there's helicopters to bugger off. The isolation that the Tibetan culture had gave birth to one of the most profound philosophies that human beings have ever conceived of. I never thought that I'd be able to visit Tibet because of my Buddhist connections. And just over that pass is the border, and we're walking in. In 1959, in a desperate attempt to keep their country independent, Tibetan people rose up against the Chinese occupation. The Chinese army cracked down with lethal force. His life under threat, the Dalai Lama, Tenzin Gyatso, had no choice. He and 100,000 Tibetans fled into exile. To China's continuing irritation, neighboring India gave them refuge. Across the border in Tibet, good roads and constant surveillance come with the deal. When we finally catch our first glimpse of Mount Kailash, we can see our objective and it gives a lift to our spirits. So sublime. And you know, it's breathless, it's windy, it's cold. It didn't stop me. I wanted to touch the water and pay my respects off of my prostration. I put three layers of head stuff on and I still think I need another layer. Let me see my gloves. <laughs> I must have some, done something good that I'm here. What are we going to be like when we get home? We'll be able to run up and down the stairs and do all sorts of things. We are ready. Mm. It's a beautiful day. We head into Darchin, the starting point for the Kailash trek. When we arrive, our obstacles multiply. It's cold, our floor is wet. I think after today and tomorrow, there's no turning back. For day one of our trek, we breakfast at 4 a.m. And it's obvious that our government licensed guide can't deliver what he promised. I don't want them to be compromised. You're pissed off. Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, me too. No, no, I'm not going to shout. I'm not going to shout. Yeah. Don't shout at me. And then I'm Big going kid. back to Lhasa. I'm not going to take this group so far. Hey, please, please. He tells Carmel she's too old to get around the mountain. I haven't had a man shout at me for many years. <laughs> it was just high drama. <laughs> because we're embarking on such an important thing, sure. it's an obstacle. Sure. After a stressful morning, Carmel kindly decides she'll stay behind in town. The 52-kilometre circuit ahead of us will test the limits of our stamina and our acclimatisation. I relax about, about doing the trek today. I'm relaxed about doing this trek today. The Kura has now started, finally. Only a couple of kilometres later, Adrienne hits her limit. It's just my lungs. Yeah, I go home with this. <laughs> I know we've got the steepest stuff to go. And I just didn't think I could do it. My lungs are burning. You've made it here. You've seen the base of the collage. She decides to turn back. Lots of photos. I want to see it. Hardest thing I've ever done. Looking over the first valley, I begin to see why Kailash is so sacred. Many Tibetan Buddhists and Hindus seek merit by circumambulating Mount Kailash 
once in their lifetime. Some find it just too tough. And I wonder if Freeman will be the next to turn back. My heart rate is dangerously high at the moment, and I can't bring it down. I don't know how I'm going to do the drama La Paz. Water is everywhere. Four of the greatest rivers of Asia flow from Mount Kailash. It's an ecosystem that sustains life for billions. I certainly feel very fortunate that I'm going to complete this Cora. No altitude or no ill health or the fear is going to stop me. For Hindus and Buddhists, a circuit around Kailash is an act of devotion. For the rest of us, it's an act of will. With Adrian and Carmel present in our thoughts, we make the final ascent to the highest point of our journey, the Drolmola Pass. One way or another, we made it, five and a half kilometers above sea level. Chairman Mao, Chairman Mao. And here is some sand from Bondi Beach from sea level. After completing the epic trek around the mountain, Carmel and Adrian join us, and we all head out to Buddha's big birthday bash. Thousands of people appear, as if from nowhere. Scott Jane Rizik, Om Mani Pemium, the peace prayer for um, compassion. Oh, I'm writing all my family's names in here so that when he hangs the, the prayer flags up, that'll send prayers to them and well wishes, and I think that's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> Every year, a new pole is erected to celebrate the birth, the death, and the enlightenment of the Buddha. The raising of the new prayer flagpole is the climax of the day. For Tibetans, a perfectly vertical pole is an auspicious sign for the coming year. This year, 2019, for the first time ever, the pole comes crashing down. Everyone wonders what this will mean for the year to come. That moment I just saw meeting second of his holiness, that's all I love. Getting this news, this is what happened. And I saw him in front of me and I thought, oh, it would crush so many Tibetans, not just around Tibet, but people around the world who believe. The authorities sense trouble, and we are immediately ejected. We drive across Tibet to the ancient capital of Lhasa. Lhasa. 
Lhasa is no longer an isolated place. It's a bright, shiny city, Lhasa Vegas. Yet despite the surveillance, in Lhasa's heart, the old Buddhist practices are alive. Tourism and consumerism thrive side by side. To complete my pilgrimage, I wanted to prostrate a final kora around Lhasa's legendary temple, the Jokang. She's doing this. It's just amazing. She's been going for just a little bit less than an hour. She'll get there. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible street. That's amazing. I was praying that all human beings should maybe all be blessed with wisdom from my ignorance and also that I could sense a lot of fear around. So I was hoping for courage and love to combat fear. While tradition of monastic education seemed to survive in Tibet, we wonder if it's just a show for the tourists. I think this is how they should debate things in, in Parliament. <laughs> Since the 13th century, the Patala Palace, Lhasa's great centre of power, had been the seat of the Dalai Lamas. It's a shell of what it used to be. Now it's just a place to come and have your photo taken. <laughs> All of the wisdom, the great teachings that it used to be the fortress of, thankfully, those teachings have been picked up all around the world. As we leave Tibet, I ask, has the Dalai Lama's international presence become China's unintended gift to the Western world? Human nature is positive. So we created this suffering. So it is our responsibility to solve this, to minimize this problem. How many islands are women my age have ever done this? I just can't believe that I've done it. And I and everyone goes, oh wow, did you really do that? And I says, apparently so. <laughs> what came back with me was a sense of camaraderie with those people that, that we had actually been on a pilgrimage together. Dude, we're living in eternity. I did have a moment with the mountain where I felt the power of that mountain. Back here in Bondi, I'm grateful we all returned safely. I brought this stone from Mount Kailash. May all beings have happiness and the root of happiness. May all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings enjoy supreme bliss which is beyond suffering. Thank you very much for joining us tonight and wherever you are, please stay safe and stay healthy and be kind to the person next to you or the being next to you and uh, join us tomorrow again, same time, um, same place on the Festival of Tibet Facebook page. And in the meantime, if you are inspired by the film, then you can make a donation. Uh, the link is in the festivaloftibet.com.au or uh, it's pinned down uh, on the tonight's program, on the comments of the tonight's program.